Father, thank you for what we've been able to learn up to this point and hear what you have to say about marriage to us. I know it's a lot of information. It can feel uh, perhaps like uh, drinking out of a, um, you know, the fire hose as it keeps, all the information keeps coming. And so we pray that you would graciously help us receive it and process it. And as we discussed at the beginning of this message, to be not just hearers, but also doers of the word. I think Pastor Kerry had prayed that too. And so I reiterate what my brother has said and asked that you would help us not just to listen, but to apply what we're hearing to our lives and our marriages. And again, if for no other reason, then that we could best serve you, Lord. Secondarily, we want our marriages to be the blessing and gift you want them to be. But primarily, we want to be good represent, uh, representatives of Christ in his relationship to the church. Use me as your vessel. I just pray that this would be a time you speak to your people. Uh, in a sense, almost remove me, Lord, and deliver the words that you have for them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. All right, the fourth message, if you want to turn to it in your handout. As we begin, we're going to come up out of marriage briefly, just for one lesson that I think is very important at this point, because if we don't obey or apply this lesson, then we're not going to uh, benefit from any of the instruction or teaching that we have received up to this point. So that's how important I think this lesson is that um, doesn't even have anything to marriage. I would take time out of a marriage conference just to, just to emphasize this to you. And it brings us to lesson one. Remember, listening is not enough. Remember, listening is not enough. So while we come to the second to last message, just want to communicate this. There's been uh, quite a bit of teaching and instruction up to this point, and if we're not applying what we're learning, then it's not going to benefit us at all. I'll try to explain something I, I witnessed when I taught elementary school and when I coached. When I taught elementary school, I'd stand up at the board and like you'd imagine when you were in school or just picture a classroom and a teacher up front, I'd, I'd go through these examples with my students just like I'm sure you've witnessed, and stand up there and I try to explain things as clearly as possible and go through one example or problem to the next like this. And then I would assign the students some <clears throat> examples to do themselves, and, and I'd walk around the classroom looking over the kids' shoulders, moving between the desks and rows and so forth. And it became evident to me very quickly that all the students in the classroom fell into one of two categories. They've all received the exact same teaching, they've all received the same instruction, seen the same examples, seen the same work, that I did up on the board, but everyone fell pretty clearly into one of two categories. You had those students who did what they were taught. They applied what they heard or what they had witnessed. And then you have this other group of students who had received the same teaching and instruction, but they did not apply it. They, they did not obey it. And when I coached wrestling, I noticed the same thing. I'd begin most practices teaching some number of moves at the beginning of practice, bring up an assistant coach, go through the moves, put the wrestlers in pairs, send them out over the mat to then practice these moves together. And you notice that all the athletes fall into one of two categories. You have these athletes who do what you say, who are applying the instruction that they received. And, that, and that's really one of the most important or exciting parts about teaching or coaching, or I would say even parenting. When you're watching your children or students or athletes learn what you're teaching them, and I've got to believe that, that, that God the Father has that same heart that he loves to see his children learning and applying the instruction that we're receiving. And then, of course, you'd see other athletes, you'd walk around, and, and even though they'd seen the same things, they just were not applying what they had learned. They weren't doing the moves the way that you had showed them. They weren't following the instruction. Now, my suspicion is I'm probably not going to have to tell you which one of these two groups did well, right? You can tell pretty quickly that one of these groups would excel, and then one of the groups would struggle or perhaps even fail. And the reason I mention this is we have the same potential with God's word or with the teaching and instruction we receive as these students and athletes that I taught and coached. And in fact, if I can be fairly um, candid with you, all of you in this room are falling into one of these two categories up to, the up to this moment and for the uh, rest of this message and the following message and even when we leave. All of you are going to fall into one of these two categories. There's some of you who are going to ensure that you're applying what you've heard, walking in that instruction, you're going to be doers, and then some of you are going to be just listeners. You're going to hear this, you might even like certain things that you hear, and you might even take notes, but you're going to be in that category of not applying or not obeying the instruction that you receive. And this is so important because it's great to receive God's Word, it, it's great to hear sermons, it's great to read the Word, it's great to go to marriage conferences, it's great to, you know, read, buy books and read them, but we've got to go beyond just learning. 
We've got to go beyond just listening. We've got to go beyond just watching. We've got to make sure that we're moving from hearing to obeying or to applying, applying to our lives. And this is one of the reasons that I would encourage you, please make sure you go through those discussion questions, or if you happen to get uh, the work, the Marriage God's Way workbook, please make sure that you go through that. This is how you'll apply or cement in your heart and mind the teaching and instruction that you've received. So be sure to go through those discussion questions with your spouse to talk about those things that you've heard and how you can then walk in the instruction you've received. Jesus taught an entire parable that was meant to make this point that I'm making. And that parable is the the two builders in Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Ultimately, that story is about these two categories of people. One category who hears God's word and applies it, and another category who doesn't, uh, another category of people who don't. And so there's those individuals who hear the teaching and then they build their lives on it. And then the other category of people who, in a sense, they're building on sand. Jesus said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat on that house. Now, in my mind, the winds and storms, the weather that's pounding on that house is a metaphor for the trials and struggles that all of us experience in this life. The the wind and the storm pounding on that house are a picture of the storms and trials that pound on a marriage pound on a relationship, pound on husbands and wives. Because they obeyed Jesus' words, it says it did not fall. Now, you can take the pronoun it and make it a marriage. The marriage did not fall. The family did not fall. The home did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Then Jesus says, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. Again, the trials and struggles. And so what's interesting is between these two houses, did they experience the same trials and struggles? They did. Identical languages used. The idea is one marriage or family is not experiencing worse worse trials than another. I, I don't want to sound harsh when I say this, but when people's marriages break up or experience struggles, it is not because their marriages are so much tougher. And when marriages stay together, it is not because those marriages are so much easier. We all live in a sinful, fallen world. We are all experiencing difficulties and trials. The difference is what we're building our marriages or our homes on. And some people are building on Christ, and some people are not. And then Jesus went on to say, it fell, and great was its fall. What's interesting is Jesus is telling this parable at the end of the greatest sermon that was ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, and all of those people on the mountainside, did they all hear or receive the same teaching and instruction? They did. They heard the exact same words from Christ, but he knew all of those people were going to fall into one of these two categories, those who obeyed what he taught and those who didn't, and it wouldn't be too much to say that Jesus' main point is listening is not enough. What's really interesting is those people who came and heard the greatest sermon in history, if they did not move from listening to obeying, they were in no better situation than those who did not hear any of the sermon at all. And so what that means is, if you have thought that any of the instruction today and last night was beneficial or profitable, if you do not apply it, if you don't obey it, then you are no better off than the people who did not come to this conference at all. It's okay, so it's, you've got to make sure that you're considering how you can walk in what you're receiving. It's a common biblical theme. God repeats himself when he wants to make sure we don't miss something, and you hear it repeatedly. Luke 8, 21, Jesus said, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and take really good notes. <laughs> and do it. John 13, 17, If you know these things, Blessed are you if you listen to lots of sermons, even if you don't put them into practice. No, he says, even, he says if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. James 1.22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Now, what's interesting is all of God's word is meant to protect us from deceiving ourselves. So when you see those few places in scripture where we're warned not to be deceived, That lets you know that we're looking at a verse or verses that pose a particularly strong area for us to be deceived, that we especially need to be on guard against being deceived. 
And right here, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. What's the deception? The deception is you can think listening is enough. That's how we deceive ourselves. We feel good simply from going to the conference, reading the book, listening to the sermon. And James says it's such a strong deception. He warns us, don't be deceived in this way. You have not done enough simply by listening or even taking notes. You need to move to obeying. James does something interesting in the second chapter of his book. He says, if you have faith with no works, you have a worthless faith. So he says, a faith with no works is a worthless faith. It's no better than no faith at all because that faith isn't doing what it's supposed to do, which is produce works. Now, the reason I mention that is hearing teaching without applying it is very similar. Hearing teaching without applying is like having faith with no works. The teaching is basically worthless because it's not producing what it's supposed to produce, which is obedience. And so a faith that doesn't produce is very similar to hearing without obeying. The hearing or listening is not producing what it's supposed to produce, which is the works or obedience. So if you hear hours of, at this marriage conference, invested some amount of time last night and today, but you don't apply it, then you're not in a much better situation than if you didn't attend at all. In fact, I could say, to be honest with you, you're in a worse situation because now something is higher. Do you know what that is? Your accountability. Because previously you might not have known your accountability is lower, but James 4, 17 says, if anyone knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. So perhaps previously you didn't know some of the things you've heard, but now since you've heard them, God really expects you to obey them. Your accountability is higher. So as we continue this message and the next one, let's make sure we're trying to apply what we learn. With that in mind, turn to 1 Peter 3, 7. 1 Peter 3, 7. looked at this passage earlier with a focus on wives, and there's one verse for men. I heard a gentleman say one time that God had six verses for wives and one verse for men because men can only remember one verse. I'm not sure how true that is, but we're going to look at verse 7. There's so much packed into this verse, we're going to break it up piece by piece. First, look at the words, husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, and this brings us to lesson two, part one. Lesson two, husbands treat their wives well by learning them. Husbands treat their wives well by part one, learning them. Do you remember earlier I talked about some of the weaknesses of the English language, especially regarding, like, for example, the word love. I love popcorn or I love wrestling. I love my wife. Right? I have to use that same word there. Well, another difference or another weakness takes place with the word know. Like, for example, I say I know my wife and I say I know of Abraham Lincoln. And obviously, I know my wife much differently than I know of Abraham Lincoln. And so what we do is we insert the word of there to distinguish between knowing relationally or experientially versus just knowing of or having, let's say, an intellectual knowledge or awareness of. Well, what the Greek did was they actually had two different Greek words, epistemi and gnosko, for the two different ways of knowing. And so the way that you would know of someone or something intellectually, like for example, I've never, I know what rugby is, but I've never played rugby. So I have an epistemic knowledge of rugby just because it's an intellectual knowledge versus a gnosko knowledge or a knowledge experientially or relationally with wrestling. So two sports, I know both of them, but I know them considerably differently. And so gnosko knowledge is a knowledge that comes not through observation or intellect or studying, but it's a knowledge that comes through understanding and relationship and experience. The reason that I mention this is if you look in 1 Peter 3, 7, that word for understanding, it's gnosko. So gentlemen, we're being commanded here not to have an understanding or knowledge of our wives through observation or intellect, but through experience and through relationship. We have to develop an understanding of our wives. We have to study them. We have to learn them. We have to spend time with them. We have to listen to them. We have to hear them to know what they like, what they don't like, what, what pleases them, what displeases them. One commentator said, get your doctorate on the subject of your wife. A good husband should know as much as there is to know about his wife. Now, as far as learning and understanding women, and this is not a joke, what does the world say? What does the world say about knowing or understanding women? You can't. 
and it makes a little bit of a joke, but I want to encourage you, don't embrace that joke. It is a satanic or it is a worldly agenda that works against what God's word says. And so if God's word says, know your wife, the world is going to combat that by saying what? You can't know your wife or you can't know women. So don't joke like that. The Bible is commanding you to know and understand your wife so that we should not expect the world to agree with God's word, right? We should expect that if God's word says one thing, the world's going to work overtime against that. And so don't be surprised when you see lots of jokes about not being able to understand women, <clears throat> but don't go along with them because you're conflicting with God's word. God's word commands us to know and understand our wives. And let me ask you this, <clears throat> or I guess I could ask the wives, do you want to be known? Do you want a husband who knows you and understands you and invests in you and learns you? And hopefully all the women would say, amen. There aren't, it's been my experience, there are not many things that women find to me more of a blessing than an interested husband who, who is, um, you know, invests that time and energy in knowing and understanding his wife. This is how wives feel loved. But here's what's unfortunate. <clears throat> There are lots of wives walking around wishing that their husbands knew as much about them as their husbands know about any number of other things. And it's very unfortunate when you hear a husband who says, oh, I can't understand my wife, I can't know her, but he can rattle off the statistics of you know, his favorite baseball player, or he can quote the lines from, from some number of movies. There are lots of wives wishing that their husbands were as interested in them or knew as much about them as they know about sports, or cars, or television, or friends, or food, or music, or video games, or you name it. So husbands, we want to make sure that we know more about our wives than we know about, I would say, anything else in this life second only to um, God's word. This is how, <clears throat> so you say, well, what is it we're supposed to know about our wives? We should know what they like. We should know what they don't like. We should know how they feel loved. We should know how they feel unloved. We should know what's important to them. We should know what they desire. And this is often different with each woman. And so this is why it's so important that we study our wives because what I know what's important to my wife, Katie, might not be important to some number of other women. We need to learn our wives' weaknesses. And then we need to live with our wives in a, in a gentle or tender way regarding those weaknesses. Katie has graciously invited me to share some of the ways that she appreciates me dwelling with her in an understanding way. I would just say that I appreciate my wife's humility in allowing me to share these weaknesses. Again, this is what she invited me to share. She says that organization is one of her weaknesses. So she, and I know she's working hard to be an organized person. It is not for lack of effort. And so because of how hard she works, she really appreciates me being patient with her or gracious with her when perhaps things aren't as organized as, as I might like. Katie has trouble finishing things she starts, so she appreciates me in a gentle way, preventing her from starting new things until she has finished early things or giving her the encouragement she needs to finish things that she has started. I think it's in Ecclesiastes, I don't remember the address, but it says that the end of a matter is better than its beginning, or in other words, finishing something is better than starting something, and Katie says that she tries to remember that as one of her life verses. She's very visionary, comes up with lots of ideas, she said that she'd never imagined having a lot of kids. And so she gets overwhelmed when we're staying places for a long period of time. And these weren't things that became clear during premarital counseling. We, didn't, we had to learn this after some number of struggles we had where we would be out someplace. And Katie has said, I'm always in a serious conversation. That's what she says, says to me. You're always in a serious conversation. So I'm trying to leave at seven and then eight and then nine and then 10. And you've been having a serious conversation with five different people over those four hours. And so what Katie appreciates me doing for her, which I think probably kind of makes me look bad as a pastor, is telling her, we're going to leave at this time. And so I tell her, if we're going to leave at seven, then that means even if I'm in the middle of a serious conversation, I need to do my best to bring that conversation to an end so that I can take Katie home and then our kids can, she can put our kids to bed. Now, for other women, maybe they're comfortable staying out really late with their kids and, you know, their kids are passing out on couches or something someplace. But for my wife, for me to dwell with her in an understanding way, she wants me to make sure that she can get our kids home. And I don't fault her for that because how, how could I be frustrated with my wife? And I just see this deep compassion and concern she has for her children. But the point is what one woman might be comfortable with, my wife isn't. And so for me to dwell with her in an understanding way, it means being sensitive to that. 
So this isn't to say we don't help our wives improve. It's not to say that we don't stretch our wives or talk to them about weaknesses, but we do so in a very gentle way as we come alongside them. Um, Every husband has a wife with weaknesses, and we remember that we have weaknesses too. So just like we appreciate our wives being compassionate with us, especially when perhaps we make the mistakes in our decision-making or other areas of life, we want our wives to be compassionate toward us. We need to be compassionate toward them. Notice the word dwell. Look in the verse, just see it with your, your own eyes. It says dwell or some translations. Maybe most translations actually say live. It's important to discuss what this verse or this, what this word means and doesn't mean because I think many people say, oh, we're living together. It doesn't mean occupying the same house. It doesn't mean being like roommates. I mean, some people's marriage, it almost looks like a, like a business partnership or something the way that they, they live together but don't have the intimacy or relationship that God commands. And so the word dwell or live, it refers to doing life together. It refers to having your spouse be your lifelong companion. If you have never up to this point thought of your spouse that way, that's how you need to view your spouse as this person that God has given you that he expects you to go through life and share as much of life with this person as possible. All of the joy, struggles, hurts, is with this person. This is the person you're going to be with after the children are gone, right? This is the person God wants you going through everything with. Now, if we tie this together, husbands dwelling or living, and then with their wives, with understanding, it's commanding us as husbands to develop this knowledge or understanding of our wives and then live with them according to that knowledge or understanding we have of them. It wouldn't make much sense to learn all there is about your wife and then not apply it to your relationship with her, right? We just talked about moving beyond hearing or listening or learning to obeying and applying. And one way we do that as husbands is we learn all there is to know about our wives. We have this understanding and then we apply it to our relationships with them or we live with them according to that knowledge or understanding. But generally, this is where I see most men myself included, failing. We, we fail to apply this to our relationships. We have, we have trouble following through. Next, notice the words, giving honor to the wife. Giving honor to the wife. I know in some of your Bibles, this might follow the words about being the weaker vessel, which I'll explain in just a moment. And this brings us to lesson two, part two. Husbands treat their wives well by honoring them. Husbands treat their wives well by honoring them. share one more Greek word with you. Please don't tune out while I share this. I think it's really important. The Greek word for honor, it means a valuing by which the price is fixed. Eight times the word for honor elsewhere in scripture is translated as price because it's referring to the value of something. Here's just two examples. Matthew 27, 6, when Judas brought back the money, the chief priests took the silver pieces. They said, it's not lawful to put them in the treasury because these are the price or the value of blood. That's the same word for honor in verse, 1 Peter 3, 7. Acts 5, 3, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Keep back part of the price or the value of the land for yourself. That word for price or value is that Greek word for honor. Now, here's why I share that with you. When it says give honor to the wife, what is it encouraging us as husbands to do? It's encouraging us to recognize our wives, what? Their value. You could even say their price because Christ purchased them or redeemed them. So it's commanding us as husbands to recognize our wives' value and then honor them because of their value. Here's where it gets interesting. There's something else about the words to the wife that's fascinating. Where it says to the wife right there, the typical word for wife, it's a noun that occurs 221 times in the New Testament. Like in verse 1, it says wives likewise. That's the word gene. In verse 5, in this manner in former times, the holy women, that word for women is gene. But right here where it says to the wife, that's one word in Greek, and this is the only place it occurs. Instead of being a noun, it's an adjective, or it's it's a describing word that means of or belonging to a woman, feminine or female. So to connect the dots here, what this is saying is you, we are commanded to honor our wives, recognize their value or price associated with their femininity. 
It is not commanding husbands to honor their wives simply for the sake of honoring them. It's encouraging us to honor them or recognize their value associated with their femininity. The wife's feminine nature is what should prompt us as husbands to honor her. It's commanding husbands to find that value because of the feminine nature of our wives. Um, so here's what's sort of ironic. The feminist movement has done what it can to move women away from being feminine to, meet, to be more masculine. And do you see the tragic irony associated with that? It is encouraging women to have less value. It is moving women away from, when they, from where they would have more value to have or to be more honored to be less honored. It encourages women to move away from what God says they should be honored for, encouraging them to move across the spectrum to be like men where they would have less value in God's eyes or in, even in their husband's eyes. It says, be like this where you'll have less value and receive less honor from your husband. So these words, give honor to the wife, it actually has a lot of encouragement for all of us. Ladies, please hear me when I say this. Whether you're young or old, whether you're married or single, whether you're a mother or a daughter, you need to celebrate being a woman. Celebrate the beauty that God has given you. Celebrate your femininity. Celebrate being a female. In, in Genesis, I mean, it says God made them male and female, male and female, he created them in Genesis 1 and then in Genesis 5. It says that twice, and it's like the world is working overtime to do everything it can. It used to be just to blur the lines between the genders, but now the world has gone so far that not only does the world say that men or women can be like men and men can be like women, now the world has gone so far to say that men can be women and women can be men. And I'll just tell you, I don't know what God must think when he looks down. I don't know what he must think, what, my, what must come to mind for him. And the things that I have to explain to my children now that I never would have imagined even 15 years ago about why there's a third bathroom, why there's not just one for men and why there's not just one for women. It's particularly important for us as Christians to take a stand against this and cry out for God's word to be observed and for men to be recognized as men and for women to be recognized as women. And so ladies, celebrate your femininity. Don't let the world turn you into men. Don't listen to the liberals or the feminist movement because this is where your honor and your value truly is from the way that God has created you and with the beauty that he has given you. Now for husbands, <clears throat> what do you need to do? You need to praise your wife. You need to encourage her in her beauty and her femininity. Help her feel like a woman. Celebrate her being a woman. Don't try to get her to be more manly or tougher. And then fathers, what application, or fathers and mothers, what application does this have for us with our daughters? Raise your daughters to be what? To be women, to be feminine. Celebrate that in your home. Encourage your daughters to act like ladies. Encourage your sons to treat their, their sisters differently. My boys, I think if they could, Ricky and Johnny, my two, two oldest boys, would probably you know, beat each other up all day if I let them. And so, and what I, and which is for the most part they're playing. I mean, I think they are anyway. Maybe Katie doesn't agree with that, but anyway. <laughs> but the point is, there was a point in their lives, they didn't see these differences. They just see siblings. They don't see brothers and sisters. So what do my boys want to do with their, with their sisters? Well, if I'm going to wrestle with, with, if Ricky says, I'm going to wrestle with Johnny, I'll go wrestle with Ray and Karis, right? Or Chloe. And I, you have to tell your boys, no, you may not. They need at a very early age to start recognizing the differences regarding the way that boys and girls are treated. You encourage your boys to pull out chairs. You encourage your boys to open doors. You encourage your boys to treat their sisters or other women differently than they might treat their brothers or treat other men. And so gentlemen, raise your daughters to be feminine. Raise them to be wives and mothers. Tell them that there is no higher calling than that. No matter what the world is preaching and encouraging women to think that the highest calling is for a woman to do anything other than be a wife and mother, we want to be those anchors that bring the, the ladies in our lives back associated with the great calling or greatest calling associated with being, with being wives and mothers. Next, notice the words, as to the weaker vessel. As to the weaker vessel, and this brings us to lesson two, part three. Husbands treat their wives well by part three, recognizing they're the weaker vessel. Being weaker physically comes to mind, 
that women are weaker physically, but I want you to notice something, that Peter doesn't say the weak vessel. Why is it a comparative adjective, weaker? Because it's supposed to communicate what to men? That we're weak too. They're called the weaker vessel because men are weak too. And in what way? We get sick. We get older and die. We can get diseases. We, you know, our bodies break down. And so it's a reminder to us, God is encouraging us to recognize that we have plenty of weaknesses ourselves too. But it goes beyond that to looking at the differences emotionally, um, mentally, and the sensitivity that should be shown to women. When you recognize it, or when you treat a woman as the weaker vessel, I hope the women don't, don't find that to be derogative, being called the weaker vessel. It's encouraging men to treat women differently and, and recognize that a man shouldn't be treating his wife or another woman the way that he treats perhaps his guy friends, like the way we tell our sons to treat their sisters differently. Husbands should protect their wives and daughters. We should teach our sons to protect other women, especially their sisters and even, even their mother. The evil tragedy that takes place is when men use the greater strength that God... Because you say, if I back up just a moment, why did God give men greater strength? What was the reason? To protect. To protect. That's the expectation. That's it. Not to be chauvinistic, not to show off, not to boast, to protect. That's why God gave it to us. And so when a man uses his greater strength to, to intimidate or to worse uh, abuse a woman... He's sinning terribly because there, it's a double sin because a man is sinning through his behavior. It's the sin of commission. He's committing the sin of being abusive, but it's the sin of omission because he's not using his strength the way that it's meant to be used. So it's doubly sinful when a man intimidates a woman or is abusive to a woman. Treating our wives as the weaker vessel means making our wives feel safe, protected, not ever making them feel afraid of verbal or mental or emotional abuse. This means it's not the wife's responsibility to deal with conflict or anger. Every husband, best as we can, should try to protect our wives, putting our wives not just between any physical danger, but mental, emotional. That means in the church sometimes. I, don't, I can't remember a time that this has happened, but there have been times, at least privately with Katie, where I have told her, I haven't had to say it to anyone else in the church, but I said, you don't have to feel any responsibility in this situation, Katie. You have enough on your plate. You don't have to worry about that. That's my way of trying to protect Katie mentally and emotionally with all the other responsibilities she has. So that's one way to do it, gentlemen, is to look at your wife's life and say, this isn't something that you need to worry about. You don't need to be involved in this. If anyone has a problem with that, you can send them to me. I've told Katie that plenty of times. You can send anyone who's grieved by anything to me, and I'll do my best to, to deal with them so you, don't, so you don't have to. The words weaker vessel probably refer also to women being different emotionally, the greater sensitivity that they should receive regarding their fears or their feelings. Um, this means we're not going to treat our wives or talk to them like I might, you, you might deal with a male friend differently, but you're not going to tell your wife you need to toughen up. You're not going to tell your wife something like, why are you crying about that? Or you shouldn't be upset now. We're going to show that sensitivity or tenderness toward our wives. And if you think about something for a moment, wives being uh, emotionally weaker or being the weaker vessel, it's actually a wonderful thing, gentlemen. Because if our wives were not the weaker vessel and they were just like us, then it'd be like being married to ourselves. And no guy wants that. No guy wants his wife to be more like a man or to be more like him. That would be a terrible a terrible thing. I mean, how many husbands in here want, want to be married to someone like them? And I hope no gentleman raise their, mind, raise their hand when I ask that. <laughs> how many mothers would really be good mothers if they were more like their husbands? I, sometimes it's like, I really want to, here's something to share with you. I wanted my children to be here. They love playing with the Greens children. I, I feel like my daughter, Chloe, who's three, has already practically started a courtship with Joby, you know? <laughs> I'm watching Joby. You tell him I'm watching him. <laughs> Little kid, man, running around, holding my daughter's hand all the time, playing in the dirt. Anyway, my kids have a great time here. I really wanted them to come. Chloe was devastated not to be able to see, to see Joby. And so we'll just have to take a trip back another time, I guess. But anyway, that, I had to defer to Katie. One of our children got sick. Karis got sick the other day. And I guess by this point, a few of our other children have started throwing up. So she was right. But what I wanted to do was I wanted to tell Katie, look, I mean, this is what my flesh wanted to do. Look, toughen up, they're coming, we're going to go have a great time, deal with it. But the motherly side of her 
could not have been here and functioned well if she thought that the children were here getting sick in some other place, maybe making the Greens children sick. And so the point is, she ended up being right. So it was her differences from me as a woman that allowed her to basically save the day. And, and now I'm, I keep hearing about other kids of ours that are throwing up at home. And so it was good, it was good that I listened to her, and it's probably good to get a little separation between Joby and Chloe anyway, since they're not married yet. You know? <laughs> now, if you need a strong encouragement regarding how seriously God expects husbands to treat their wives, after all we've been talking about, look at one of the most sobering statements in all of the New Testament regarding marriage. It says that your prayers may not be hindered, that your prayers may not be hindered. And this brings us to lesson two, part four. Husbands treat their wives well by part four, being spiritual men. By being spiritual men. I want to make sure you see the flow or the context. I appreciate all the verses in Scripture and being numbered and so forth, the chapters, but sometimes it compromises our ability to see the context. And so let's not look at this verse in isolation. Let's consider the flow from the previous verses. Beginning at verse 1, wives are commanded to submit to their husbands, trust their husbands, spiritual leadership, and then it flows down to this discussion of a man's, of a man's prayer life being hindered. And so the point is, to be a spiritual man that makes a wife's submission easier or makes it easier for a wife to submit to her husband, it means being a man who's prayerful. It means being a man who's in God's word. It means being a man who's involved in the body of Christ. Wives are going to have a much easier time submitting to a spiritual man. One of the best ways, gentlemen, for us to treat our wives well, if the title of this message is uh, treating our wives well, one of the best ways for us to do that is simply being spiritual men. If God's word commands you to love your wife, one of the best ways that you can love your wife is by being a spiritual man that makes her submission easier. Because when your wife is terrified of the decision that you're considering making, what will be one of the most encouraging things to her? That you are a spiritual man who prays, who knows God's word, who seeks God's will, who's involved in the body of Christ, that you can receive counsel from others. Gentlemen, one of the simplest, and I don't know who attends this church. I don't know who attends what church. I don't know how often you attend church. Nobody should take this personally. But one of the most basic things for you to be doing, gentlemen, is have your wife on the Lord's Day worshiping corporately with the body of Christ. And by regularly, I don't mean once or twice a month. I mean, you're looking at three or hopefully four times per month and also being involved, not just showing up, checking in, and then checking out. That's not involved in the body of Christ. There are plenty of ways for you to serve and be active. And when you're doing that, your wife can look up to you and trust that you're a spiritual man, and it will make her submission that much easier. Whatever position you hold in the military, no matter how, high you might, how much you might promote, everyone has the same fear that they're going to have a commander over them that doesn't have their act together. No matter what rank you are, you're always, your greatest fear is that you're going to have to submit to someone or receive commands from someone that is incompetent or inept. Do you see why I'm saying that right now? That is every wife's fear. That's what every wife is terrified of, being married to a man that she thinks is incompetent or inept and that is going to make bad decisions that ruin the family. So the best thing you can do to alleviate that fear is be a spiritual man that your, woman can't, your, your wife can more easily trust. Now, God takes the treatment of our wives so seriously that he actually says he's not going to hear our prayers if we are mistreating our wives. So no matter how important our spiritual leadership is, and we can tell by this point that it's of the utmost importance, God says, regardless of how important it is, if you try to pray, with me, pray to me and you haven't been treating your wife well, then I'm not going to hear from you. Now, I'm ashamed to say we live, we live um, in a parsonage next to the church, I have walked toward my office some mornings and about halfway there had to turn around and go back to my house to make things right with Katie because I knew I had not treated her the way that I should. And when I get into my office and I start studying God's word, praying for insight, lifting up people in the congregation, that God isn't going to hear me. I can almost hear it bearing, I almost feel it bearing down on me, God's silence toward me that he doesn't want to hear anything from me until I have went and made things right with Katie. And so I have to go back 
ask for her forgiveness and make sure that this relationship is right before God wants to hear, hear from me vertically. The Greek word for hindered, it's the word cut down. And just follow me on this. The Amplified says, in order that your prayers may not be hindered and cut off, this word for hindered, it's used throughout the New Testament for cutting down a fruit tree. It literally means, in Matthew 7, 19, every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down. That's the word for hindered. Luke 13, 17, he said to the keeper of the vineyard, look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on the fig tree. I have found none. Cut it down. Again, that's the word for hindered. So you could say, well, why would God use a word about a fruit tree being cut down to describe our prayers being cut down? Because it's meant to communicate the imagery that our prayers will be fruitless. Our prayers will not produce anything. God is saying your prayers will be hindered or they'll be cut down because if you're mistreating your wife, your prayers will not be answered. They will not produce any fruit. Since God has called us to be spiritual leaders, what we need most or should most covet is God answering our prayers. Spurgeon said to true believers, prayer is so invaluable, the danger of it being hindered is used by Peter as a motive in our marriage relationships. The only prayer that God wants to hear from me or other husbands when we've mistreated our wives is the prayer of repentance. That's the only prayer he wants to hear. He wants to hear us confessing that we're sorry for the way that we have treated our wives. Now, I've reached one of those times that I'd like to go back to the Old Testament. I shared with you last night that the, New Te- that the Old Testament contains accounts that uh, provide illustrations or examples of New Testament truths or realities. So we've just looked at 1 Peter 3, 7 regarding how husbands are to treat their wives. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at two examples in the Old Testament of men who didn't obey this verse. <laughs> we're going to look at two men who really could have benefited from 1 Peter 3, 7 in applying that to their relationships with their wives, but they didn't. Go ahead and turn to Genesis 30. Genesis 30. Jacob could have benefited from 1 Peter 3, 7. He did not treat his wife well. Here's the situation. Jacob had two wives, Rachel and Leah. That's part of the problem right there, isn't it? (laughs) Having two wives, obviously inconsiderate and sinful, and that's how you don't dwell with your wife with understanding, right? Having another wife or another woman in your life. And so sometimes people can wonder, and I might as well just bring attention to it briefly, why it seems that men were allowed to have more than one wife in the Old Testament, I would encourage you not to look at it that way. Consider that there are many things that are descriptive without being prescriptive. One of the worst mistakes we can make with Scripture is when we, can, is when we take something that's descriptive or described and we prescribe it or find it instructional for us. And so just because people did it, the point of, if I made it real simple, just because people did it, it doesn't mean it was right. And so the way that you determine the rightness or righteousness of a decision or action is you look for a command in the New Testament supporting it, and if you don't see that command, often you can also look for what's produced from that decision. So for example, Jesus said wisdom is justified by her children. What that means is the wisdom of decisions is justified or shown to be wise or foolish based on the children or what's produced from that decision. So if you're wondering the wisdom associated with having more than one wife, you look at what was produced in those relationships. Now, anytime there was a man who had more than one wife, what characterized that relationship? What characterized that home or family? Strife, conflict, turmoil. What didn't characterize it? Peace, joy, harmony, love. And so you can tell that it was problematic for husband. Polygamy was problematic simply because of the children that were produced by the decision of a man to have more than one wife. Every single instance, you will not see one single instance in the entire Old Testament of polygamy ever producing peace or harmony in a relationship. Always problematic. Now, chapter 30, Genesis 30 begins right after Leah had given birth to four sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, How many children had Rachel, her sister, who also happened to be her husband's other wife, have had at this point? How many children had she had? She hadn't been able to have any children. 
In the Old Testament, there were not many things worse for a woman than not being able to have children. Many women would say that that has not changed today. It's one of the worst burdens or trials. And I would say, I can't think in all my years of pastoral ministry that I've had many women pray for this, but I would be blessed to pray for this, for God to open the womb. It was one of the more common things that he did in the Old Testament. I don't know why we don't hear that request more often today. Perhaps because, children, because people do not view children as the blessing they are. You can't get away from children always being presented as a gift and blessing in God's word, but our world has convinced the church that the children are not a blessing. And so that could be one reason that people don't pray for children more often. The other reason might simply be that people are embarrassed. But I just want to tell you, if you want to have children, you feel like the womb is closed or you've been unable to, it'd be a great blessing for me and privilege to be able to pray for you that God would open the womb. And you see that throughout the Old Testament. It's one of the more common themes for God to open the womb when women couldn't have children. Now, Rachel, she's struggling because her womb is closed. Look at verse 1. Well, she's struggling because her womb is closed, but she's also struggling because her sister keeps kind of popping out kids, right? And it's this very difficult moment for her. So just imagine her, 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 her frustration, depression, discouragement. And look at verse 1. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister Leah, and she said to Jacob, Give me children or else I die. Now, one of the reasons that I like this example is it has instruction for husbands and wives. Like we discussed earlier, women are generally more emotional than men. This can, off, this can often be a good thing, but often strengths can have accompanying weaknesses, somewhat of a double-edged sword. And, what is the, and while it's good for women to be more sensitive and emotional than men, what is the other side of that? The potential for them to be too emotional, too sensitive, to be melodramatic. And is Rachel being fairly melodramatic at this moment? Now, yes, it was terrible that she couldn't have any children, but talking about dying because of it is pretty extreme. Second, who did she hold responsible for her suffering? Take a look, it's not a trick question. Who did she hold responsible? She holds Jacob responsible. She says, give me children or else I'm going to die. Now, was it really Jacob's fault that she couldn't have any children? We know it wasn't because Jacob had been having children, right? So I don't need to go into the, you know, the physiology of this, but it's pretty evident that the fault wasn't with Jacob. The fault was with her, but she was still blaming him. Rachel should not have talked to Jacob like this. She shouldn't have blamed him. She should not have taken, she should have taken, instead of taking this to Jacob, where should she have taken this? To God, because he was the one who could have done something about this. So the application for wives, this is what I'd ask you, ladies. Do you hold your husband responsible for your suffering? When you're having a bad day, are you going to make sure that your husband or perhaps the rest of your home is going to have a bad day too? When you're upset about something, do you get upset with your husband? Some wives and mothers, they do this. And this is what can make that husband feel like being on the corner of a rooftop or being out in the wilderness is more attractive than being at home with this woman who's taking her problems out on me, even though it's not my fault. Plus, much of Rachel's anger, it stemmed from what? It stemmed from her sister, Leah, being able to have these children. So her anger wasn't motivated by something Jacob did. Her anger was motivated by jealousy or enviousness, which is a sin. So it was sin that was motivating this in her. It says she envied her sister. So ladies, I would ask you this. Are you jealous of what other women have? Do you struggle with this? Are you envious? And if you are, I mean, do you look at other women and you're jealous of their homes? Or you're jealous of their lives? Or you're jealous of their children? Or you're jealous of their husbands? And if that's the case, then do you take it to God in prayer that he will give you contentment in the situation you find yourself in, or do you take it out on your husband? Are you like Rachel was here, and you're, make, you're going to make sure that you punish him, punish your husband for all of the, the difficulties or struggles or suffering you experience in your life simply because you're so envious of what other women have? You look around to other wives and mothers, and how much better or easier you think that their life is than yours, and so then you're hurt, and so then instead of going to your husband and saying, will you please pray for me, help lead me through this. Could we read some Psalms or verses together? Instead, you punish him and, and take out that anger on him. Now, with all that said, 
What does Jacob at this moment have the opportunity to do or be like toward his wife? He could be loving. He could be compassionate toward her. He could recognize that she's the weaker vessel. He could recognize that she's upset for a very legitimate reason, that this is a difficult trial that she's going through. He could pick, pick up his handout, right, with all the le lessons filled in, and he could look at that, and he could say, how can I dwell with my wife with understanding? How can I give honor to her, recognizing she's the weaker vessel, and then it's reasonable for her to be upset? She's a female, and much of her femininity is bound up in being able to have children, so this must be terribly difficult for her. I know what I'll say. I will say, I'm so sorry you haven't been able to have children. Let us pray. God is a God who answers prayer. Let's pray that he opens the womb and blesses you with children. I know that this must be very difficult. Those are some of the things that Jacob could have said. Let's take a look at what he did say. Verse 2. Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel, and he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? And this brings us to lesson three, part one. Husbands mistreat their wives by part one, responding in anger. Husbands mistreat their wives by part one, responding in anger. Other translations say he became furious, his anger burned, or it was kindled. And this is a very fitting account. I mean, God's wisdom in the things that he records in Scripture and how fitting and applicable to me continually, continually both surprise me in a pleasant way and, and bless me because I, I just see so much application because I look at this and when a wife is upset or when a wife is emotional, Jacob is such a perfect picture of the way that husbands are tempted to respond in anger, be upset toward their wives. For, for acting this way. Um, you know, God commands us to dwell with our wives with understanding, which would mean considering why our wife is upset, putting ourselves in her position, showing compassion, striving to be strong for our wives at that moment. That's what God's word would command. But right here, we see Jacob doing the opposite of that. Very insensitively, he just gets angry at, at his wife. Now, the irony associated with Jacob's words, if you just look at his words, don't look at the way he said it, but let me ask you, did he say anything that's not true? Look at his words. Did he say anything that's not true? He spoke truth. But does it make sense if I say you can be right and still be wrong? And he was right, and, he was, and I have been right plenty of times in my life and been wrong because of the attitude uh, of my heart or the way in which I said something. So he was spot on in what he said, but it was so ugly and, and hurtful the way that he said it. While it, was right, while it wasn't right for Rachel to talk to Jacob like this, the point is it also wasn't right for Jacob to respond to her like this. Turn to 1 Samuel 1 for the next example. 1 Samuel 1. I'll explain this situation while you turn there. There's a man named Elkanah. And Elkanah also has, unfortunately, two wives, Hannah and Peninnah. And so you start to see some similarities here. And between these two wives, one of them, Peninnah, could have children, and Hannah could not. But there's something about Hannah's situation <clears throat> that makes it even worse than Rachel's situation. And it's that Peninnah was particularly cruel to Hannah. Perhaps there was some um, jealousy there, maybe that Peninnah knew that uh, Elkanah had stronger feelings for Hannah. It seems to me like between these two wives, Hannah was definitely the easier one to love or the, or the gent gentler wife. So it'd be very easy to understand that Elkanah would have stronger feelings for Hannah. And so for whatever reason, it seems like Peninnah was just hated Hannah. She was cruel to her. And so it was bad enough for Hannah to not be able to have children. It's bad enough for her, hu her husband to have another wife. It's bad enough for that, for that other wife to be able to have these children. But then it's made even worse when that other woman is cruel to you and mistreats you and, that was, and throws it in your face. Look at verse 6. This is Hannah. Hannah's rival, Peninnah, provoked Hannah severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she, this is Elkanah, provoked her, provoked Hannah. You're told the same thing twice. So you can see how bad it was. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. 
So if you read these two verses and you see that twice God says the same thing about Elkanah provoking Hannah, that's not a mistake. It's God's way of making sure you don't miss it because it's that important to see how bad it really was for Hannah the way that Peninnah treated her. Now there's an interesting similarity and an interesting difference between, um, between Jacob and Elkanah. The similarity between Jacob and Elkanah is they both mistreated their wives. Jacob mistreated Rachel, and Elkanah mistreated Hannah. That's the similarity. The difference between them is Jacob mistreated his wife by being angry toward her, and Elkanah mistreated his wife, believe it or not, by trying to encourage her. You heard me say that correctly. The way that Elkanah mistreated his wife was by trying to encourage her. Look at verse 8. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? And this brings us to lesson three, part two. Husbands mistreat their wives by part two, responding in pride. Husbands mistreat their wives by part two, responding in pride. I'll give you something that applies to marriage, but I'd, I'd really like all of you to hear it because I think it applies to all of us as Christians because all of us should see ourselves as counselors. Does that make sense? If you're a Christian, you should see yourself as a counselor. It's not something just for pastors or elders or home fellowship leaders to do. We should all be familiar with God's word and able to counsel others. And listen to this verse that's particularly profound and applicable to counseling or especially to people going through trials. Proverbs 25, 20. Like one who takes away a garment in cold weather and like vinegar on soda is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. So in other words, when someone is struggling or grieving and you go and you try to encourage that person or cheer them up, it's like taking away a garment or coat in cold weather or it's like pouring vinegar on their soda. When someone is hurting or struggling, you don't need to go to them and say, oh, things will get better, or all the terribly, terrible cliches and, and platitudes we offer, or even, oh, God is working this together for good in your life. That's, those are not the things that people want to hear when they're suffering. And the worse the suffering is, the more inclined you should be to just listen and be quiet. A great verse or a great quote is, if you can't improve on silence, don't. <laughs> if you can't improve on silence, don't. It's been interesting, the number of people who, to me, have seemed to be very concerned about going to someone when someone's grieving, especially when it's a serious loss, like the loss of a child or an unfaithful spouse, and they say, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to say, and I say, perfect. You can do a great job then if you just go and don't say anything. Because most of the time when people are really suffering, they just want someone to listen. It's called the ministry of presence to just go and be with them. You, you can sit back and you're just like, oh, I'm not Pastor Kerry, you know, and I'm not going to know what to say, and I'm, or I'm not an elder, and I don't know the word that well. That's fine. You can, the best thing that you can do, you can offer, which is simply time with that person and being there listening. It's like Job's friends. They receive a lot of criticism because for you know, 37 chapters of the book, they look really bad, but there's one verse where they, really, they were really hitting a home run because it says, for seven days, nobody said a word because they saw how great his grief was. So they did really well while they were silent. They got into trouble when they opened their mouths. And so the point is one of the best things you can do when people are hurting is go and listen, hear everything that they wanna share in their heart, and then, if you don't know what to say, say, may I read this psalm to you? And find some psalm, pray over the word, see what psalm God gives you, and say, this psalm has ministered to me, or this passage, or these verses have ministered to me. May I just share them with you? And then just read those verses, and that can be an encouragement. Don't think you need to have all the answers. Don't think you need to cheer up the person, because that would be the wrong approach. And that's the approach that, that Jacob took here. He tries to cheer up his wife. He basically said, look at the number of things that he did wrong. He says, why are you crying? Remember I said, as husbands, we shouldn't say this. You don't say to your wife, why are you crying? Second, he said, why aren't you eating? Why is your heart grieved? Now, there's two possibilities with him asking this, and both are bad. One possibility is he's being very insensitive. 
He knows why his wife is crying and grieved because she can't have any children and this is a terrible burden for her. And so he, knowing why she was grieved, he should not have asked her this. The other possibility is he really didn't know. And he was such an oblivious husband. We were talking about husbands understanding and learning their wives. And he was so unfamiliar with his wife. He knew so little about her. He did not even understand why she was so upset at this moment. So either way, it just was not appropriate for him to say this. Why are you upset? Why aren't you, why aren't you eating? Why are you grieved? And then pretty much the, the king of all insensitive, prideful things that a man could say to his wife, he says, am I not better to you than 10 sons? <laughs> Which is basically, isn't being married to me better than having as many children as you could ever want? I mean, it just oozes with pride and insensitivity. So he rebukes her for crying and mourning, and then he tries to encourage her by saying, why are you upset about not having children when you can have what? Me. That's what he said. And he is a man who, at least in this moment, shows that he did not understand his wife and did not know how to treat her sensitively. This is a terrible response to a hurting woman. Now, what does it look like for husbands to be like this today? Because there's application. When God takes up precious space in his word, there's a, there's a reason for that. And what is the application for us? Gentlemen, if you say something like, look at me, you get to be married to me, you're acting pridefully and insensitively. You're acting like Elkanah here. Aren't you glad that you're married to me and not so-and-so? And then you probably name the worst husband you can think of because we can always think of husbands that are better than us, but we never say, aren't you glad to be married to me versus like this great husband? Because the answer to that might be no. So we think of the worst husband, we can think of him and say, aren't you glad you're married but there's no way to ever say this without it being a prideful, ugly thing to say. Look what I give you. Look at all that I've done for you. Look how I take care of you and provide for you. Some of the things that I said might seem pretty absurd. You can't imagine yourself saying that. But I will say this, gentlemen. If you say something to your wife along the lines of, look what I give you. Look what I do for you. Look how much I've done for you. Look how I sacrifice for you. Look how I serve you and serve our home you're bordering on being very much like Elkanah. If you want your wife to see all you do, don't pat yourself on the back and tell her. Pray that God opens your wife's eyes to see those sacrifices. And I would share with the women, I would invite you, strive to have open eyes that do see the ways that your husband serves your family and works hard to take care of all of you. But gentlemen, don't make those statements to your wife. It's very insensitive and prideful to start listing all the different ways that you think you're a wonderful person and how hard you take care of, of your wife. Just pray that God would reveal those things. So husbands, when our wives are upset, let's make sure we don't do these things. Make sure we don't respond to them in anger because we lack patience, and let's make sure we don't respond in pride telling them all the wonderful things we've done. I want to conclude this message by asking the husbands, and I ask myself these questions too. Would our wives say that we are interested in them and interested in understanding them? Would our wives say that we honor them and that we value them, especially according to their femininity? Would our wives say that we invest in them, in learning them? Would our wives say that we treat them as the weaker vessel, understanding they're more sensitive and adjusting to them? As a result of that, would our wives say that we're spiritual men who pray with our families and encourage them to trust us and respect us? If you want to know the answers to those questions, that I would encourage you again Go through those discussion questions together and ask your wives those questions. Now, I'm going to close in prayer, and then you're dismissed for uh, 10 minutes or 15? 10, oh, five minutes, okay. And five minutes, go stretch your legs and, and go to the bathroom and whatever else you need to do, and then come back in here, and we'll conclude with our last message. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this time. I pray that you will help us to treat our wives well, treat them as the weaker vessel. I pray that women wouldn't... Um, would see what those words mean and not interpret them in ways that they don't mean, that they wouldn't take offense, but would see that it's God's way of encouraging us as husbands 